Hi, guys. Thank you for coming. <sighs> that was pathetic. Hi, everybody. Hi. There we are. Thank you. We appreciate you coming. There's, pro there's no doubt a lot of good, fine alternatives that you could have been in right now. So thanks for choosing us. We hope it'll be not terrible. Uh, is it the title? I should have put more buzzwords in there. More. 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 Okay, next time. And, well, there's always next time. persistence for microservices using Spring Cloud and Neo4j and microservices and Docker. If we put Docker in there. I think. And the cloud. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I was sold on four, just the preposition. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And we do actually have Docker, so yeah. that it wouldn't have been weird. I mean, it, it's a little weird. C groups and namespaces. C, yeah, no, that's not buzzy. No, I'm getting Could better been, at okay. this. Okay. Spring, Spring for yeah. J. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new thing. It's, yeah. All right, so let's let's get into it. Oh, look at this. Big uh, call out for our friends in the open source world. This stuff this stuff thrives. Everything we're going to talk about today is all open source, and it, it dawned on us why we're while we were preparing for this talk uh, a long time ago, almost 50 minutes now, uh, that, that uh, this wouldn't have been possible without really, really great community interaction. And, and uh, so thanks to. Yeah, so thanks to Graphware, Michael Bachman, for getting out the, you know, the latest Neo4j, uh, Spring Data Neo4j release. I know that they worked really hard on it. I don't even know if they're here. So oh, let them I, know that, you know, when you see them. I wouldn't have been here uh, if I could have been at their talk instead. Are they so, speaking now? No. Oh, then I'm glad we're here. Well, thank you to them. Yeah. All right, so you want to do a selfie? No, they I already did that. I feel yeah, like, yeah, we skip we're, we're OK. I'm first? Yeah. Oh, hi, guys. I'm Kenny. I'm Kenny Bastani. Uh, I'm relatively new to, uh, to Pivotal. So I work at Pivotal. I'm a Spring Developer Advocate. Josh was the first Spring Developer Advocate, so I, I guess I would be the number two. Yeah. Yeah, I can settle for that. That's fine. We're writing a book, Cloud Native Java, so that's going to come out in January. Uh, this is all about um, writing applications with Java in the cloud um, on a platform like Cloud Foundry uh, with Spring, Bru Spring Boot, um, and it's going to be great. Josh? What? Me, I'm Josh. Hi. Uh, well, yeah, there's that. Okay, moving on. I'm, I'm on the Twitters, by the way. How many of you are on the Twitters? It's 2015. Twitter? 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 No one. No one's, no one's on Twitter. Nobody. Literally no one. Zero people. How many of you are on email? Email? Okay, email. If you're on the emails or on the Twitters, uh, we're online. I mean, that's, that's my, my Twitters and my email. So if you leave this talk with more questions than when you came in or, you know, you have ideas, hate mail, whatever, uh, recourse. You have recourse now. So please don't hesitate to reach out to, at the very least, me and, of course, uh, my friend Kenny here, uh, which is probably statistically given the pattern, his first initial and then his last name at pivotal.io. It's a good bet. Yeah, good bet. Yeah. We're both there at your service. That's so we do have a complaint thing. hotline for you, right? Right. There's yeah. a complaint hotline that's been set up uh, for good. me specifically. So there's that. Get into it. So we work at Pivotal. How many of you have heard of Pivotal? Anybody? Any, no, well, I, more of you have heard of Pivotal than Twitter, which is Awkward. We're, we're a small startup uh, here in, in the Valley. Um, started in 2013. Uh, we're a spin-off of uh, another upstart company that I, I believe one day is going to be big. Uh, two of them, actually. Um, you watch this space. One of them is called EMC. Have any of you heard of EMC? No? No one? Nobody. No one. OK. Uh, and then VMware. VMware, right? Anybody here? Have, no? No one. OK. Awkward. So we're, we're, a, we're a small company, lots of great open source technology, not the least of which, of course, is Spring. And, and how many of you have heard of Spring? OK, good. Unanimous. Everyone in the room, of course. Uh, Tomcat. How many of you have heard of Tomcat? OK, OK. Uh, RabbitMQ. What? <laughs> and then Redis. Tickled. What? Redis? OK, good. So these are technologies. They're kind of, they're, you know, that's cool. Um, and we like these technologies. They, they serve our overarching sort of narrative, our overarching theme of helping customers deliver things to production as quickly and efficiently and safely as possible. We spend a lot of time talking to developers and to customers and to users uh, who are trying to build 
modern workloads. They're trying to build solutions for modern workloads. Uh, and of course that, you know, there's a lot of great technologies out there, but we don't really, beyond the technology, we care more about moving quickly, right? It, the technologies will come and go, but the ability to move production, move code into production as quickly as possible is what drives everything we do. So, uh, and we spend a lot of time talking to developers about how to get that done, you know, more efficiently today. Uh, we've seen customers that spend a lot of time, and indeed, we're not the only ones, of course. We see a lot of developers, a lot of people in the community trying to build applications, and they're trying to deliver them into production as quickly and safely as possible. But we see there's a, a few different reasons that they are unable to move forward. They're, they're gated by certain things. Uh, what Netflix realized uh, is that when you have a typical IT organization where work flows from product management to user experience people to, to then the developers uh, and, and then on to QA and on to the various administrators, what you get is this gated sort of conveyance of work across these different workstations. Uh, when you talk about lean manufacturing, this, we talk about something called inventory. The queuing between each workstation is inventory. That's waste in an IT organization. And this waste comes from the fact that you have to wait your turn for each of these different workstations to do the work you're trying to get done. So even though it may take the product managers maybe a couple of days and the user experience people another couple of days and the developers maybe a, you know, four days a week or whatever, uh, and the QA and the administrators each uh, days or hours, even though it may be in aggregate about a week or maybe two weeks for all of this work to get done, the actual clock time might be months, right? Because you have to wait for all these different um, uh, organizations to have free time. And so the, the, the time to live between actually having an idea and then getting it into production is a long, long time and it's very frustrating. This frustrates your ability to move quickly. Uh, of course, the developers, you know, modern developers, this is not very controversial, modern development teams are agile, right? Modern development teams move code quickly into production, we hope. I don't know anybody who's uh, cantankerous and really, really aggressive about waterfall. I've never gotten into a fight who's like, with anybody who says, no, agile's not gonna work, it's a fad, you know? It's not, it's not a thing, at least, it, at least in my ivory tower ecosystem world, it's not a thing, right? So. Uh, that, that's one reason people are unable to move forward, is because while developers are, are agile, the rest of the organization is very waterfall, right? And so this, this trend has a name, we call it water scrum fall, right? Where, where developers are doing the right thing, they're doing TDD, they're doing agile thing development, but everybody else is slow. Um, <clears throat> Netflix, of course, famously realized this problem, and so they moved to something called feature teams. They decided that instead of having uh, uh, different workstations, they would focus one team on one set of features. All right, all right, all right, good stuff. <laughs> they would focus on one set of, of features, one set of, uh, of deliverables, and they'd have these people focused on, that de de on the development and delivery of that feature. Well, of course, if you have too large a feature, then it makes sense to break these things down into smaller pieces. But if you spend too much time synchronizing code and stabilizing code and integrating code, then you lose some of the benefits of this more agile delivery process. If you have to spend days just to wait for everybody to freeze their code and deliver it, you're unable to, it makes, you, makes it harder for you to move forward and to deliver stuff. So uh, what you end up doing is looking for ways to focus small teams on small single sets of features. And this naturally leads people to something called microservices, right? This idea of small singly focused features delivered as small, independently deployable services. <sighs> which, is, which gets us to where we are today, right? The, the modern application is delivered as a set of small microservices, and the things that used to cause uh, gates um, at the end of the process, all, the, all those things having to do with uh, operations, have now become automated, right? We have the cloud. So, uh, by having small teams working on small features, building small microservices, and then automating everything afterwards, each team can now deliver value, functionality, uh, as, they, as, they are, as these features are ready, and they're no longer waiting on other teams to, to, to have them. This microservices architecture has a few benefits. Uh, there's a great talk by a guy named uh, Chris Richardson in, in that book. In that talk, he talks about this amazing book called The Art of Scalability, uh, which is by two professionals who have consulted with all manner of different organizations, including eBay, and they provide this scale cube, and I think this is actually very apropos for describing some of the benefits of microservices. It gives you three axes on which to scale your application out, right? Functional decomposition, 
the idea that you break apart an application in, into small functional blocks, uh, microservices in essence, uh, is one of the axes by which you can scale applications today. Naturally, you also have horizontal duplication or basically uh, you know, uh, load balancing across multiple um, similar nodes, and then lookup-oriented splits or, or NoSQL, right? The idea that you can now shard or, or use um, scalable data access technologies. If you embrace all three of these, you get, at least in theory, near infinite scale, right? So that's obvious. I think most of us, when we talk about microservices, we know about these uh, vaunted and, and famous and well-tread benefits. One of my favorite benefits of microservices, and one, one of the reasons we're here today, is that now, when you break things out into small, singly-focused services, you are forced to formalize the boundaries of these services. You're forced to formalize what the domain means within each service, because you no longer have a distributed transaction. You no longer have the ability to transactionally uh, in, you know, make consistent these different shards of the domain model. Uh, and that's a good thing, right? It, makes you, it forces you to be a little bit more crisp and clear in the definition of these model terms. And in point of fact, when we see when we look at most domain models, we find that there's, a, there's an opportunity to do this anyway. If you look at uh, the example here um, from Martin Fowler's Blicky entry page on, on the subject, he's got this example of a sales context and a support context, and they have a shared domain model. They, have this, they both have this notion of a customer and of a product. But a customer and a product in terms of the sales context is a very different beast altogether than that of a, of a customer and a product in the support context. In one case, you're trying to incentivize somebody to buy. And the other, you're trying to uh, support somebody who's threatening to leave, right? These are very different sides of the, uh, of the spectrum. And one is about saving, one, about, one is about persuading. So these things are internally um, consistent. Within the, within the support context, they me it means something very crisp. In the, within the uh, sales context, it means something very crisp. When you have one ERD diagram or one graph to, to rule them all for everything, that definition becomes a little bit muddied. And so it becomes very useful to be able to formally separate these things into different domains, different contexts. This idea is not new, of course. It was uh, first put forward you know, most coherently by Eric Evans in his classic tome, Domain Driven Design. How many of you, by show of hands, have read that amazing tome? My favorite, Michael, he's, uh, he's read it. And that my, the gentleman in the back. If, if you haven't, uh, check it out. It's a great book. If you. If your kids are restless and you want something to read to them, it's a good story, good story, good read. Keep it under your pillow. I do, <sighs> for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so this idea of a bounded context fits very naturally in the microservices world. It also gives us, uh, microservices also give us the ability to choose our, do our database technology, right? Because now that we've separated the different domain models in terms of these network barriers, these network boundaries, APIs, uh, we, you know, all these different services will communicate with each other via the service, not by the database. We're not able to then reach in behind some other services database and ask it questions. We need to communicate through the REST API. Once you've done that, once you've divorced uh, data access from databases, well then who cares what database you use behind that REST API? That gives you freedom. It means that you can now use the right database technology for the job. And this is actually a very, very big uh, win because you know, in traditional organizations, we see a lot of, um, I, I like to call it database gravity, you know? This idea that I've got an Oracle database, it's already there, and we might as well just add another table. We need to do full text engine search. Can we do that? Well, in theory, yeah, so let's use that. Shouldn't we be using a full text engine, you know? Or shouldn't we be using a graph database? Or shouldn't we be using whatever it is that's appropriate for the, for the data access requirement at hand? Uh, now that we have this formal network boundary, this modularization, we have no reason not to use the right tool for the job, right? Because it's not easier, per se, to, to just add it to something else. Um, and this gets you to what we, talk, we, what we refer to as polyglot persistence, right? This idea that you can use the right technology for the right job. Do you want to speak to the slide at all? I can, actually. Please okay. do. So with microservices, right, so each team gets one database. That's usually the rule. So you have these teams, they're, they're smaller, um, I, I guess I've heard the, uh, the story about a two pizza team, so a team that's big enough to in one day uh, for lunch maybe uh, consume two pizzas. Um, and each one of these teams and organization uh, is going to get a microservice with their database. Um, you can have a platform provided service like Couchbase sitting in the middle. Um, that's really more of a service, not just a database. Um, and then each of these services will get their own database and they can be different. Um, 
Specifically, let's talk to you a little bit about the structure. I'm going to show you a demo later. So I have this demo running on Lattice on EC2, which I'm going to show you later. So we have a user service, and that's connected to MySQL. And we have a uh, recommendation service that's actually using MongoDB. There's a re reason for that. We have a rating service. So that's using Neo4j. It's connected to a Hadoop cluster, um, which we have an analysis service, Spark, running as a microservice in Spring Boot. Um, and we also have the movie service, which is using MySQL as well. So that's pretty much it. And that was a very good explanation for those of you who can't you see can't the see uh, entirely too small font in, on the entirely too small screen in the back. OK, What's great. This? So we agree. We agree that uh, you need to be able to move code into production quickly. You need to be able to chew off the smallest piece that you can possibly manage to be able to do that. Uh, you need to build APIs, in essence. And there are a lot of different ways to build APIs. I've heard, uh, in theory, that there are other languages besides Java. Nobody's ever proven it to my satisfaction, but I've heard it, right? Um, and it may be true. I don't know. You know? Uh, and that's another benefit of this microservices model is that if you are using one of these other hypothetical technologies that may or may not exist, to, you know, I don't know, uh, then you can, you can coexist, right? These are just become a APIs. Uh, if you're going to use the JVM, I, I think we both agree. We both wholeheartedly endorse something called Spring Boot. How many of you have heard of Spring Boot? Okay, so I'm going to give you a quick demo. Um, Spring Boot is a, is a convenient way to stand up APIs and applications. <sighs> There's a lot of different ways to use uh, Spring Boot. When people use it, they think, of it th they think it's, oh, it's just for bootstrapping an application, which, fair point, it's our name. We, we, maybe we could have done a little bit better on the name. But uh, it's, in fact, actually just a very opinionated way to stand up applications. And to drive that point home, uh, there's this epic tweet by Spring Boot co-founder Phil Webb, where he describes Spring proper as a set of different tools that you can use in application of whatever you want, and then Spring Boot as the final product, cake. Who doesn't love cake? Okay, so if, that's, if there's one message, take that home. Uh, Spring Boot is cake. But so let's talk a little bit more about that, right? So Spring Framework, the ingredients here we're looking at, those add up. So you, what are some of the different components you have? Like security, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you can decorate this cake as you will. Here's a chocolate cake. You could have a vanilla cake. You could have red velvet. Um, nobody, nobody likes red velvet. <laughs> no, they don't. It's, well, that can it's be the Mongo service. Science. It's science. It's science. <laughs> I'm not going to argue. Uh, it's a fact. It's not a flavor. Nobody likes it. So. Anyway, I agree, 100%, right? So we, all these different pieces, while indivi individually very powerful, uh, it's, it's a little bit, the, the devil, as they say, is in the details, and composing all these things can be a little bit tedious, and uh, Spring Boot does remove a lot of that. And above and beyond that, it actually provides the integration for a lot of other things above and beyond the Spring ecosystem. Um, so it's gotten very popular. In fact, uh, insanely popular. It has these graphs, uh, not this not the right kind of graph, but chart. it's a graph, this chart. As this chart uh, um, displays, in July of this year, we had 1. What is it, 6, 1.6 million, million d downloads, right, uh, per month, right? That's a lot of downloads. The, the thing has gotten pretty popular. In fact, it's our second most popular spring ever, right, after Spring Framework proper, which, of course, you need to be able to build Spring Boot. Uh, it's pretty good. It's got, you, you may not even know it, but you're probably using something that's based on Spring Boot already. How many of you have heard of, there's a small um, uh, analytics company here in the Valley that's been very heavy into, into Spring Boot. How many of you have heard of uh, Netflix? Anybody here? Netflix. Anybody? Nobody. Okay. Okay. Um, what about Ticketmaster? They are the masters of tickets. How many of you have heard of them? Nobody? No one. <laughs> what about Baidu? That's a, a third largest search engine in the world. It's, yeah, nobody? It's in China, yeah. Um, China scale. Forget web scale. China scale. Uh, what about um, Alibaba? Alibaba. Anybody here of them? Alibaba? Bigger than Walmart in terms of revenue, which is crazy. They're also in China. So all of these are big companies that have chosen to bet the farm on technologies like Spring Boot, right? So uh, these are small examples, but there are others. And Spring Boot makes it very easy to pull together various parts of the Spring ecosystem, not the least of which, of course, is Spring Data, Spring Data Neo4j, which we'll cover in a bit, um, right? Because Spring Data is an umbrella project. Underneath there are different modules that uh, service different types of data, data access technologies. I'm sure you all saw Michael Hunger's epic, epic Ignite talk earlier on, on Spring Data Neo4j. You did do one, right? Oh, whew. okay. I'm sure it was amazing. I 
I'm a big Michael Hunger fan. I'm just gonna say it. I'm just, I'm just gonna say it. Yeah. Um, so that was, you know, there's a lot to be to be had from this particular module. But the point is, it provides dead simple access to to both the Neo4j database from a, from the Spring ecosystem, uh, and that's fairly easy to pull into a Spring Boot project. Another thing that is very very powerful when you're building an application is the ability to describe a REST API, right? And so not just any REST API. Actually, uh, we know about typical REST APIs that take advantage of HTTP idioms and headers and verbs and so on. Uh, but that is a little bit lacking in that these REST APIs don't provide any information for the clients that are accessing them about what they can do and where to go given a certain resource. So that to support that pattern, we have something called hypermedia or HotOS, Hypertext as the Engine of Application State. If you want a deep, deep discussion of hypermedia and how you can use it to provide APIs that are navigable without any a priori knowledge, I would uh, wholeheartedly recommend Dr. Jim Weber's, uh, I hear he's kind of a thing here, is that anybody? No? Yeah. Heard of yeah. Him? Go Jim Weber. Dr. Jim Weber's canonical tome, uh, uh, Rest in Practice by O'Reilly, 2011, TM, okay? <clears throat> so, hypermedia is the engine of application state. It looks like this. You've got a payload, the payload has metadata, the metadata is described in terms of links. Uh, the links are, uh, there, there, there are things that tell you where you can go given a certain payload, right? If you look at how we work with the, with the web as human beings, as, as uh, wetware, we go to a typical page, say Amazon.com, we see links and we can understand the context around the links. We can see the human or, or not, you know, human readable pros around the links and that tells us that in order to navigate to the next state in the process of perhaps buying a book or something, we should uh, click on this link. Taken together, these, these navigations create a protocol we know as humans that we have to click on this one, this one, and this one, and this one, and this one to achieve a certain result. That same mechanism is very powerful, but of course, hum you know, machines can't read human prose. So you can give machines the same cues about what you need to do give, you know, to create a protocol by giving them links, metadata. They get a payload, they look at the links, the links tell them what to do next, and they can follow the sets of these sets of steps to achieve a result. So, Spring Data REST makes this dead simple. Um, I wanted to show you Spring Boot first here. So we're gonna do a quick demo on Spring Boot. Uh, very, very quick. Oh boy, we only got 17 minutes. So there are lots of ways to get started with Spring Boot. Uh, me, I like start, nope, start.spring.io. Okay, this is one way to create a new Spring application if you get a chance, it's, it's darned cool. Always choose the latest and greatest. There's RC1 that just dropped this morning. Uh, and of course, you, get the, you can choose what kind of application you want to build. You can uh, specify the, how do you zoom? Oh, son of a gun. Okay, okay, we'll be fine. It's so awesome. You can choose uh, the, kind of pay, the kind of archive, the kind of deployable unit you want, uh, JAR or WAR, okay? So if you are by some fluke of physics stuck in the distant past, unable to move forward to the future, which of course is today, uh, then, then choose WAR. But if you're here today with us, uh, then choose JAR, okay? This is in keeping with our personal philosophies of make JAR, not WAR. Now, you have choices. You can choose whatever you want, but again, I think this is pretty obvious. Now, uh, once you go down here, you can choose the kind of things you'd like to have in your application, build an API, that's, you know, all these things are here. Check boxes, and then you hit generate, and it'll give you a little project you can import and, and use in any IDE you like, uh, even NetBeans. Is, is the, does anybody here use NetBeans? Anybody? No? They, oh, there's the one guy. Every conference that we go to, every single one, it doesn't matter which country, there's always that same guy. Stop following me, man, it's weird. It's weird. So you can use uh, start.spring.io, that's a good way to go, or you can use the Spring Boot CLI, uh, and that gives you the ability to create little uh, scripts. So I'm going to say touch hi.groovy, atom hi.groovy, and we'll make this ginormous. And you can say at rest controller, class greetings, rest controller, okay, def hi, path variable, string, oh my goodness, for want of time. What I'm doing is I'm describing a REST API here uh, in as simple a po way as possible, and I'm gonna map it to an endpoint, forward slash hi, forward slash name, like that. So whenever somebody goes to localhost, 
forward slash 80, or colon 8080 forward slash high forward slash name. It'll bring up uh, this method, or invoke this method, and that'll respond. I can run it like this. I can say spring run high.groovy. The spring boot CLI is a, a little thing installed on the command line there. Uh, and then, of course, I can go here, localhost high graph connect. And there's that, right? So simple REST API, that's fine. I, I, and, and it's very simple. I appreciate that some of you are thinking, well, that's all very well and good, Josh, but we can't take the Spring CLI into production. We don't have that running there. We need some way to deploy this uh, manually. So of course, you can do Spring jar, high.jar, high.groovy, and that'll give you a little jar file that you can then run, java minus jar, high.jar. And that makes it very, very simple to then deploy this. So simple, in fact, that I could send this to my grandpa who's got applets on his computer, and he could run this. So if your operations team isn't able to deploy this, you can fire them. It's the law. I've checked. It's the law. You can dismiss them. They can consider new careers. It's too simple to fail. Okay? So that's one way to go. Uh, of course, when you move into a distributed system, when you start creating lots of different little REST APIs, you're now squarely in the camp of distributed systems programming, and uh, that ain't easy. Right? There's a lot of concerns that start to arise when you need to integrate these things, non-functional requirements that become very obvious very quickly. One thing is service registration and discovery, the ability to find a service by its logical ID, divorcing the availability of a service from the host and port on which that service is running. Um, there are great technologies that you can use to, in support of that, things like console or Zookeeper or etcd or, or Netflix's Eureka. Uh, there's also configuration. I need uh, keys and values, database locators, credentials, properties, all these kinds of things. I want to be able to decouple the configuration of a service from the process that is running that service. I want that to be in a single place. If I want to, be able to, ch if I want to change a configuration value, it's nice to be able to do that live. Uh, and of course, gateways, right? I need the ability to stand up a facade or, or a door into my system uh, so that other services don't have to compose things manually. So a gateway is a very nice way to do that, and we use something called Zool from Netflix. These things are hard, right? Uh, unless you have Google's or Netflix's R&D budget and their engineers uh, and the years and years of time it took them to get there, you're not going to be able to pull this stuff all together by yourself. Indeed, even Netflix can't pull it all together by themselves. Even they would rather stand on the proverbial shoulders of giants and, wherever possible, reuse. And so Netflix, among many others, are using something called Spring Cloud, which actually provides a cohesive integration of all these different pieces uh, and many more beyond uh, those that I could find icons for. Uh, and it also supports all these design patterns, these patterns that you need to build distributed systems. Spring Cloud, of course, is built on top of Spring Boot. So if that first example of cake didn't get you, get you excited, then surely the Spring Cloud cupcake picture does, right? Um, you're going to need to deploy this. You're going to need to you're going to need to be able to deploy this and manage this. And for that, it's me. Run, buddy, run. Yeah. Okay. So we got about 11 minutes here. So we're going to try our best. But I'm going to explain to you uh, more of the platform side of things. So this is where we tail into Neo4j. I'm sure we haven't said it enough. This is a Neo4j conference, but this really all this stuff is to set up really this ability to be able to deploy Neo4j to a platform, right? And using something called Docker. Um, and so Lattice actually is a platform as a service. Um, it's a lot like the Amazon Elastic uh, Container Service, but you can download it and you can host it yourself. Um, you can use Terraform to apply it to EC2, so it'll, it'll go ahead and set up your cluster. And so really what this does, um, it allows you to really have a cluster of containers in the cloud that are connected using Spring Cloud, um, and you can have this polyglot persistence architecture. So you can choose the cloud provider you want. You don't have to use AWS. You can use DigitalOcean. There's others. Uh, and you can actually use uh, your private repo from Docker Hub. Uh, sorry, your own private uh, repo, or you can use Docker Hub, which is public. OK, so this is pretty exciting. So let's talk a little bit about how this works. So this is really kind of the future of how things really should be in the cloud, which is everything scales elastically, which is that based off of demand, you have your VM scale up and down, um, and that's going to control costs, right? So what we're looking at here is a virtual machine. We have multiple containers running on each virtual machine with our applications. So one of these applications could be Neo4j, which would connect to a volume, right? 
So this auto scaling is this elastic scaling based off of demand. You can have high availability based off of usage. So it can actually look at a spike in traffic and predict that it's going to need to scale up and down. So in order to get this working correctly with Docker, with containers, you need something called composition, which connects these things together. So we'd have something like service discovery, which is provided by <coughs> Spring Cloud with Spring Boot uh, to be able to register your applications inside the containers when they spin up. So let's, we're gonna do a demo now. Um, wish me luck. Um, we're gonna look at this, okay. So I explained this earlier, so I'm gonna actually show you what this looks like. I've, cre I've created my cluster already. Um, so I'm not going to roll the dice on creating it now, um, but you can go to lattice.cf to get all the information about Lattice. Um, so what we're gonna do here is we are gonna look at our uh, user service, rating service, movie service. Um, I don't have the recommendation service in there um, because I don't like MongoDB. Um, so wish me luck to the cloud, Marty. Okay, so are we gonna show them code? Spring data, spring data Neo4j. It's a good idea. Um, okay, so. Bigger. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, yeah, it is. Go to f preferences. Okay. Or command apostrophe. Just do it real quick. Yeah, but, okay, let's see. Eight minutes. Well, we got, we, technically we started five minutes uh, late because it's true. the previous guy was here, which is, a, I'm sure it was a great talk. I'm not complaining. Okay. Okay. Can you read that, friends? Do your thing. Thank you, Josh. Yes, sir. Okay, so um, what we have here is the multiple services. So these are each Spring Boot applications, um, and they're pretty small, so you can't see them. But I'm going to open up the Neo4j one, which is the rating microservice. And so what we have here, so Josh showed you what a Spring Boot application looks like. This is using Spring Data Neo4j. It's not using the latest yet, because I created this before the latest came out. Um, so what I'm doing here is uh, we see that we have a Spring Boot application annotation that indicates that this is a Spring Boot application. Um, I have some other annotations here. Um, I won't explain them. The Zool proxy, that's Spring Cloud, um, which is creating uh, essentially a, a reverse proxy to other services in the API. Um, and so I'm, I'm binding a couple values for configuration, which is um, I need a data set URL because I'm gonna do some bootstrapping. Um, and by bootstrap, I mean I'm going to run a Neo4j query so here in the command line runner, um, we have this uh, bootstrapping method, which is going to look at AWS. It's gonna pull down a, a CSV file, and it's gonna use uh, Neo4j's Cypher query language to do a batch import. Um, and so this is all very ugly, and Cypher looks very beautiful, not so much inside this IDE. Um, but just to give you an idea of what's happening on startup here. So I'm connecting to Neo4j, go ahead. Oh, it's reading, okay. You wanna explain, walk them through the thing? Yeah, sure. So sure. connecting to Neo4j, right, with the URL that's provided, um, and then I'm using graph database configuration, so I'm creating an index, I'm retrieving the Neo4j template. Uh, so this is the API that runs on top of Neo4j and sends Cypher queries to the Neo4j server. So I'm creating an index on user, then I'm creating an index on product by ID is the property. I'm committing those transactions first, and then I'm going into the user import. So then I'm importing a set of users and their relations. So a user is connected to a product, they've provided a rating, and that rating has a certain value. Like Netflix would be a good example. How many stars? Um, I'm not gonna go through this whole query because it looks a little ugly, but basically what we're doing here is we're loading in that CSV. Uh, each row is going to have information, it's uh, normalized, and I'm going to pull that in, and I'm gonna push it to Neo4j, and I'm creating this data set. There's 100,000 nodes, I'm gonna show you actually in Neo4j. So, let's go to Neo4j and see that pre-compiled. Bigger. Bigger? Bigger. Good? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's see what's in this database. So I'm gonna just gonna run an all nodes query. But let's limit it. I found her feeling more. That's a nice query language. Thank you, Michael. Just testing to see if I have some data in here. Let's turn autocomplete off. Where's the data? Are we out of data? We're yeah. never out of data. Okay, so here we're seeing, uh, this is, so this is a shape, so I explained this already. So we have a product, we have a user. Um, in the ratings relationship, you can see here at the bottom we have a rating. This one's a five. So actually, what I'm doing here is I actually, 
in a distributed system, I don't really need to provide the rest of the information as properties on each node. So here, I'm, my intention is really just to have an index, a relationship, and then another index. So we have an ID from a user, which is in another database somewhere else on another service. And then we have a product, which also is another service. So the point of this is to run analytics. And then I'm going to pop that into something like MongoDB. So that's that. Um, so now let's go ahead and take a look at um, the end application. So I have a Spring Boot application, which is a very simple UI. Um, and this is going to call the movie service. So I'm searching here for movies. Um, this is a partial query, so Star Wars. Um, let's see, Back to the Future. <coughs> Oh, yeah, we'd have it in here. Good. Um, so this is just showing some information from my other service. And we can actually go look at the movie service. Dang. OK. We're going to go here. We can't go bigger here. Anyway, so here, um, the movie service, I can access it. Let's see. Uh, and since we're using Hot OS, uh, I can uh, have links. So I can go to the repository. I can see the movies in the repository. So that's the data that we're pulling back for that UI. Um, now we also have a user service, which is running MySQL. So I can see all the users in the repository. So this is using Audio S. It's, it's using paging. Um, and then finally, I can see the Neo4j data service, which is rating. Actually, let's go to the top. And so we see a couple links here. These are each repository. So we have ratings, um, which would be the relationships that connect the user and the product. We have products, which is just the product node. And then we have users, which is just the user node. Um, so I can go ahead and take a look at that. This is using Spring Data Neo4j for the ratings. And so we can see that we have these records that describe the relationship between a product and a, a user. So that all amounts to being able to use those APIs to query data uh, from a UI. Uh, so here we have another, uh, this is using Spring Boot Vaden. And is it Vaden or Vaden? Vaden. Vaden, I think. Um, so this is just a Java-based uh, UI. Um, and it's being constructed, so I'm calling, actually I can show you what this looks like, it's pretty simple. Let's see, where are you? Nice mapping of POJOs to entities using Neo4j, node entity. Graph ID, all these things get ma ORM mapped for you by Spring Data Neo for J, which is wonderful. Uh, so here's a different application. So this is the UI search application, and in here I'm I'm actually binding um, a Fain client, this interface, to my relative paths in my services. Um, so you can see in the rating the ratings client, uh, this is actually binding to the Neo four J data service, um, which we just looked at. So we have ratings here which is going to pull back a, a set of page resources. That's going to be loaded in the, uh, the UI. So if we go back to the UI, so if I click on, so these are the users. If I just click on one of the users, oh, no. Session. Oh. It's those containers. No. It's too good to be true. Let's see. All right, so let's see, Lattice real quick, let's see what's going on. Okay, so this is Lattice. So I introduced this earlier, and I have to make it smaller so you guys can see it. Um, and so this is my cluster running. Um, so I can see that I have an app name. Uh, so I have, conf I have the config service. I have the discovery service, which is Eureka. I have a movie service, which we looked at, the movie's UI. I have Neo4j running, and I have rating and user. Um, so I can actually manage these resources here. And so since we're having a problem with rating, let's go ahead and uh, let's just try and scale it down. Is it rating or it's movie UI, right? So let's scale movies UI to zero. Okay, so now if I go back to the application, I should see that it's uh, no longer running, no route. We're going to scale it back up. And I can actually look at the log output from the cluster. So we can see that it's spinning up. OK. 
Okay, so let's go take a look real quick at the discovery service. This is using uh, Spring Cloud Eureka. So we see that it registered. Um, so I don't know if it's gonna work, but we're gonna try it, but I think it was a good debugging session. I don't have much time left, so let's take a look. Success. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, we're out of time now, so uh, we'll take a quick round of questions and then we'll let you guys go. Please, yeah, questions, thoughts, feedback. And where can they go if they have more feedback when oh, they right. leave the room? The precious last step. What is that? Uh, All the way to the right. Extra slide that we don't need. Where's our, is this the right deck? No, it's not. This is, where's ours? I guess we have two open. Wow. Sweet nectar. No. Can't even slide. We'll there. there so, go. questions, thought, feedback? Yes, sir. So as, as he alluded earlier, he's got that exact same setup. He's got a Neo4j graph with just IDs to these things that can be used to link. Exactly. So state synchronization is hard when you move to distributed systems world. Uh, for reading data, of course, REST is a very good fit, but you don't want to use REST to write data, especially if you want different systems that have the same shared state. So CQRS messaging at its basic uh, is going to give you that. So CQRS also ha takes it a step further. It optimizes the uh, writes from the reads. It optimizes for the fastest path to do both. And often messaging, uh, eventual consistency, is a great way to guarantee that data will be written and it'll be synchronized. Uh, but it won't block the world as a, as a distributed transaction might. Uh, and then of course REST is a great way to read. You know, you just pull down as you need. Um, so yeah, CQRS is a great pattern for that. And we do support that. There's, some, there's support in Spring Cloud uh, for something called Spring Cloud Stream, which makes it dead simple to uh, compose services by logical IDs. You can send and receive messages by logical ID as opposed to by actually knowing where the message queue is and all that stuff. Uh, it'll use, it'll defer to things like Redis, to Kafka, to, to RabbitMQ, and so you become you just write code in terms of I want to I want to receive a message and I want to send a message by a logical name, just like you use a service registry to decouple REST calls. Uh, so you can use a logical name to find and resolve that service. You can use a logical ID to to, to talk to other services by this eventing me messaging uh, substrate. Does that help? A little bit. See, you're on the right path. Is my point. CQRS is definitely the right way to go, and check out Spring Cloud Stream. Uh, yes, sir. Wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, I can take that. So I created a little integration called Neo4j Maze Runner, which is the current Spark integration. You can act, you can use Spark in many ways with Neo4j, but I created just a simple Docker container that does it. Um, so it's actually using that. I mean, that's that was the idea. I didn't really want to go to that level of complexity for a demo. Um, because we have a lot of parts moving, um, but that's how it's working. So there's basically a RabbitMQ um, you know, that's sitting there that's sending messages back and forth, and we have HDFS running on under that. Um, what RabbitMQ will do is to pass just links, paths back and forth, where it's going to batch import or import, uh, run the analytics, and then push it back into Neo4j. Yeah. Anybody? Any other questions? Yes, sir. I could probably take that because yeah, I'm doing it here. Um, so there's this whole, uh, the idea is that you're passing IDs back and forth. So 
um, that becomes the universal currency between these microservices. Um, so what I'm doing here specifically, when I'm joining, I'm, I'm basically doing a glorified table join with services, um, is that I'm getting IDs from one service that's referencing another service, and I'm getting that information from that service to bring it into the UI. So for the case of ratings, you just have an ID from one node to another node. If I need to get the properties of that, I can call another service and, and get that in. So how, does that, how is that performant? Uh, you just get a list. So you get a list of these IDs separated by commas, and then it's going to parse that, um, split it, and it's going to load those records in. A bounded context, so it would be one domain, right? If, so what do you mean different do domains like URL domain? The seams. So, if you're, if you have the need to talk to to understand both data sets, then of course you're going to want to have an aggregate view of both of them, right? Uh, so, for for example, actual search, full text search, it's not unreasonable that both the sales context and the support context would then also asynchronously write off to something like a like a Lucene or a Solar or whatever, right? Uh, or Elasticsearch, which Spring Boot also supports. Yeah, it's a view, right? These are all, that's the benefit of CQRS, by the way, is that uh, CQRS says, or event sourcing says, okay, well, we don't have one true world view of all the state anyway, and even if we wanted to, each of these systems is gonna create their own system-specific view of the state. So optimize for that, assume it's gonna happen, and just publish events whenever something changes to the main model, and then the full text engine can create its full text search engine view of the state, the graph can update its view, et cetera. Cheers. Other thoughts, things, and words, and stuff? Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank I you appreciate guys. it. We all appreciate it, you know?